This is Seeking Sustainability Live. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I'm talking with Shannon in California. I'm so excited to talk kimono culture from outside Japan. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. I always joke, there's nothing better than talking kimono for me. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get interested in kimono? Um, at first, you said you started as a 10-year-old. Let me see if I can adjust my camera just a sec here. As a 10-year-old, you started uh, with a pen pal. Is that right? Yes. Yes, I did. I had a uh, went through school, and I had a pen pal from Shikoku, and we would exchange pictures, and she would start teaching me some Japanese and some kanji, and we exchanged coins and all the cute things you do when you're 10 years old <laughs> and exchanging things, and that's what first started it for me was having my pen pal. Wow, that's awesome. And then you talk about um, you also went to a Nisei week. Tell me yeah. about Nisei week. In, in Los Angeles, they have a festival. It's every August. Um, sometimes it wanders into July. It's around Tanabata. And they have a week long, I think actually sometimes they send through a month long festival, but they have a king and queen. They have Odori dances, they have demonstrations with taiko and kimono and urosenki tea ceremony. And I went down to the festival, it was about 10 years ago now. And that's when I first bought a yukata and it was you know, pink, pink's my favorite color, obviously. And uh, that's what really got me started talking to the owner and getting dressed. And she was showing me all the pieces and talking about the symbology on the kimono. And after that, I started just collecting blindly. I started going, I love this. These are beautiful. And started looking at them and buying them online when I would start started to learn to use eBay. That was a big mistake. <laughs> and um, then it progressed. And like I said, about when I told you about four years ago, I met my kimono kitsuke instructor. So I started to formally learn how to dress in kimono and that just put everything into hyper. And ever since then, I have just been, it's a daily thing. I'm online and I'm researching, I'm studying, I'm finding new things about kimono every day. And I just can't believe how many layers there are. It looks so simple and it's so deceptive in how simple it looks. It's great. Uh, in the series so far, we've talked to Kimono Sheila, uh, who's very passionate about mixing Western styles and traditional Japanese styles. We've talked to Paprika Girl, who knows so much about kimono culture and has embraced a lot of wearing kimono in her daily life in Japan. Uh, you reference um, them sometimes. in, And it's just, it's so nice also. And I think both of them who are experts in kimono would also say, it's so nice to see enthusiasm for kimono in other countries. And in terms of perpetuating kimono culture and sustainability of kimono culture, it's really important that it is abroad in other countries. I loved Sheila Cliff did a recent TEDx that I watched, and I absolutely adored it when she said that the sustainability of kimono is so much more than in so many other cultures because, and just to kind of quote her, she said, if you were to wear your grandmother's dress, the dress of your grandmother's, in my case, that would put me in the 20s, um, people would say that you were odd, you were eccentric. They would look at you like, why are you wearing a flapper dress from the 1920s? But when someone wears an antique kimono, or in Japan especially, wears a kimono of their mother or their grandmother, it's, it's honored. It's, oh my gosh, you still have that connection to your family. And I absolutely love that. I love researching when I get kimono that have mon on it, have the family crest, what family, where is that family from? And finding all that kind of research as well. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, you are also introduce something really interesting, I think, especially for people living in Japan, might not realize that there's so many beautiful Japanese gardens around the States. And you were like a volunteer guide, a docent at one of the gardens. Is that right? 
Yes, I still am a docent. I work at the Japanese garden in Van Nuys, California. It's called Sui Ho En. So it's the garden of bright water and fragrance. And we're on hard lockdown still, unfortunately, because the quarantine has not been fully lifted here. But I've been a docent there for five. This will be actually my sixth year if I actually get to do tours again <laughs> with it. And we, if there are 300 Japanese gardens in the United States, there's one, I believe, in California. I've visited 13 total so far in the United States in my travels. And it's, an, it's one of those extra goals of mine to visit as many of them as possible and document them as well. So once, it's, once, hard, once the hard lockdown is open, if you get a chance, you can ask for me. I'm a docent there and I can give you a guide through the, through the Japanese garden. It's six acres. It was built in 1981. And so they celebrated over 30, over 30 years now. And it's a beautiful place a beautiful place to go and of course you can come in kimono and take and you know take pictures with your cell phone and enjoy the quiet that they have there yeah that's gorgeous and you've also introduced other gardens that you've been to other japanese gardens when i visited uh san jose area mm -hmm. uh end of 2019 i went yeah. to japantown and they've got gardens and museums and stuff, of course. But I had no idea that there's 300 around America. I just didn't realize. Amazing. Yeah. I know. I, when I first was told that by the owner of, not the owner, the man who managed the Japanese garden in Van Nuys, he said we're in like they were like listed as number 10 out of the 300 as one of the top ones to visit. And I was blown away, 300 within, and there are so many festivals. When I started researching before, obviously, you know, again, quarantine, to go and to visit different festivals, I was finding hundreds of Japanese festivals throughout the year, beginning with everything from Cherry Blossom, Tanabata, Obon festivals, all the way throughout the year in all parts of the United States. So it's a much there's much more, it seems, Japanese culture here in the U.S. very spread out than a lot of people realize. And that's another one of my passions beyond the kimono is going around and as soon as I can beginning to document that and show people that, yeah, that's, that's here too. You can find all kinds of things when you come. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I grew up in Hawaii and in Hawaii, of course, we have a lot of Japanese culture. Uh, we have gardens. We have bon festivals uh we have even learning japanese bon dancing in elementary school i remember you know we were taught to dig the ditch throw it over your shoulder throw it over your shoulder you know <laughs> these are things that i've seen later in my life in japan and it's so funny to remember that i was taught that as an elementary school kid in hawaii so these connections between um, Japan communities around the world, of course, feed back into tourism, feed yeah. into perpetuating Japanese culture in many ways. It's it's wonderful. Uh, tell us about your kimono you're wearing today. I love it. Is it yukata? It's a it's a yukata, and it has the the chrysant is chrysanthemums on it and pink for sakura season that we have and it's very warm here right now in California it's over 80 degrees and so I was going to wear something much more formal I'm like it's very hot here <laughs> I'm going to wear something more for the season which that's another thing that we we were taught in my kids pay classes is they say adjust your kimono for your season you I'm teaching about micro seasons in my kimono minute but my instructor something I've discovered about Japanese people here in the U.S. is they do adapt themselves to the culture and the climate that they're in. So my teacher would say, if it's a hot in April, even if they're still wearing winter or very heavy spring kimono in Japan where there might be snow, she's like, wear yukata as early or as late as it's going within your climate or where you are. So there is an adaptability that I really I really love as well working with my, she's from Nagoya originally, but working with my instructor, she's very much adapted and 
teaches a much more global, I think, view going into kimono, which is a lot of fun. That's great. Um, I see we have Ross joining us from South Australia. I have um, interviewed uh, people in Melbourne, Australia, who have a deep passion for sake culture, um, who have a passion for bringing cycling groups to Japan and finding kimono in Melbourne. So I know Australia too really represents Japanese culture and communities quite a lot it's it's so nice thanks for joining ross <laughs> now you have been to japan i'm showing one of your photos you went to arashiyama yep. where is that arashiyama is just outside of kyoto and i can't remember the train right now it was a it was quite the whirlwind two weeks i think we had a new city or a new part of japan about every two days for two weeks when I went. But Arashiyama is just outside of Kyoto. I think it's considered part of Kyoto. And it's where the very famous bamboo forest that everyone's always taking pictures at is. But when I went, I was more interested in going to the Kimono forest, which is just, uh, again, outside of the bamboo forest near the train station that they have that you travel to. And they have these poles that light up at night that are filled with kimono fabric. And it's just amazing and beautiful to wander through, especially I got a chance to go during cherry blossom season. So it was even more beautiful with the cherry blossoms blooming. And then you had all these poles with this kimono fabric in it. It was, it was amazing. I want to go back and see it at night. I didn't get to see it at night, but I've seen pictures. I want to go. <laughs> Yeah, that it looks amazing. I've, you know, even though I'm living in Japan, um, there's a lot of things. And I noticed this, of course, when I go back to Hawaii, now that I've lived away, is I do things as a tourist, which I never did as a resident. And so it's so nice to talk to visitors to Japan, because I've lived here so long that there's many things I don't notice. And it's so nice to have the fresh perspective from the visitors. Um, so I definitely want to seek out that kimono forest. That sounds really fun. Yeah, when, when you're there, I will, I'll have to send you the link. There is a Buddhist temple there that has a restaurant that serves you Buddhist fare, just north, I believe, of the forest. And it's absolutely delicious. And it was amazing. You get to sit within... A, the dining room and you get to look out and you get to see the the gardens and that was amazing an amazing experience I do I do know I have one friend who jokingly says and I do get asked people say do you wish you were had been born or were you living in Japan and I said you know I like living outside Japan because I feel that it gives me a like you said with a tourist it gives you a really fresh eye and you do a lot of searching for things that you may not always do living in LA I don't necessarily go to the beach every single day. You think I would, <laughs> but I don't. And I don't always know when something, when I see people doing walking tours of LA, I'll go, but I didn't know there was this you know, awesome bookstore called the last bookstore in downtown Los Angeles with all, they've built arches and all kinds of amazing structures inside of their bookstore that you can go into. And you find that from the tourists who come through. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. Uh, speaking of books, uh, you have shared on your Instagram uh, some of the books that you study to learn about dressing in kimono or kimono culture. Can you yeah. introduce some of your favorite books? The one I always go back to, I believe it's just called The Kimono Book. It's the very, very first one that I bought and right now, I'm, I, I'd have to go into my computer and look up all the names. I've read so many of them, but it's just called The Kimono Book. And it's the first one that everyone gets that was created, I believe, shortly after the war. I believe it was the 60s when it was written. So it was one of the first books that was written on dressing in kimono. And something a lot of people don't know is the way we dress in kimono right now and the kimono schools that you go to for certification all started after World War II. So a lot of the rules and regulations that you see people wearing kimono in right now are less than 100 years old. They existed, but possibly in pieces from different parts of Japan, and they were brought together 
in the in the schools. So kimono has changed quite a lot over the years and how it was worn, how it was worn in Taisho or Meiji is not exactly how it's worn today. Yeah, interesting. And you also collect uh, antique kimono, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, let's talk about your Comic-Con experience because you were teaching people how to wear a kimono or giving like a demonstration about tying an obi. Tell us about that. That looks really fun. I do a kimono 101, which is a basic kimono history and dressing class combined. And I introduce people to all the different pieces that it takes to dress in kimono. I've taught in four different states and I've taught almost a thousand people at this point combined. So I believe I've attended about 20 different events doing it. In fact, my next one coming up is I'm doing a virtual presentation for Fanime in, at the end of May. And basically, I find that a lot of people know about kimono or have seen kimono on YouTube, tried to watch, but they don't know all the pieces. My, my first question I often ask people, and I'll, I, you might know the answer having spoken with Paprika Girl and Sheila Cliff, but how many pieces does it take to dress someone in a just a typical kimono? How many would you guess? Oh, no idea. <laughs> it can take up to 24 pieces. Wow. Someone. Yeah, just... I know there's a lot. I, yeah. I usually don't wear a kimono. Um, mm -hmm. But since talking to Sh Kimono Sheila and Paprika Girl and so many people, have, you know, who have made me realize how sustainable kimono culture is as a sustainable fashion, I'm trying it more and more. And every time I go to a kimono shop and get dressed up, there are a lot of pieces that need to go into putting it together. That's for sure. Yeah. And that's what I always start with because they don't. And then I try to introduce because to make kimono fudangi, as we call it, which is to wear kimono every day is called fudangi. It really becomes important to try to find ways to introduce people to kimono that's not intimidating, that's easier for them to wear it so they can look traditional, but perhaps without all the heavy, oh my gosh, I've got to learn how to tie this and I've got to learn how to tie that. And that's where a lot of the new innovations like neoprene with Velcro and elastic, uh, Koshihimo, I actually have an example real quick, I'll lean over. This is a Koshihimo that is Velcro and neoprene that's really easy for you to just Velcro yourself around the waist with compared to, let me go back here. I have a traditional Oshihimo tie where you have to learn how to tie this around your waist. And the way you tie a Koshihimo is not just tie and go. There is actually a special twist that you do to keep it flatter so it doesn't show and there isn't as much bulk when you start tying the different layers onto yourself and you're supposed to just kind of switch the knot from side to side to make everything smooth. But that sounds very intimidating when it's like, oh, you have to wear this Hada Juban, Juban, you have to have six Koshi Himo. And again, with sustainability, kimono is something that is comfortable enough to wear every day. And if you're in Arizona, which is one of the main places I actually do presentations, I've introduced, they have things called Shtate Eri, which is a fake collar that gives you the appearance that you're wearing a juban, but all it is a white strip of fabric that you tie on around yourself. And then you can have a more elegant appearance. You can tie a quick wrap skirt on, a uh, susuyoke, that you can tie underneath. So you kind of have that when it, if your skirt happens to, the skirt of your kimono flips open, but things that are a little bit lighter and a little bit easier to go with. So it encourages people to wear kimono daily, even, even not in Japan, even in a wider effect. Wow. I can't imagine uh, people in, Ho well, maybe in Hawaii, maybe in California, just walking around in kimono, but you, you've shared some photos, uh, even going to Disneyland or going to Irvine. There's somewhere in Irvine where they have big Hello Kitty yeah. And everything, right? So there are yeah. some places in California that you would feel comfortable enough to wear kimono? 
I've worn kimono out to get tea at the local coffee play. I am so comfortable wearing kimono and my, I, I'm part of a kimono club. I'm actually part of the San Diego kimono club, even though I live in Los Angeles, my teacher and my kimono club that I'm with are in San Diego and there are 300 members strong to it. And they are always encouraging me to wear kimono and to go out and bound. They get very excited when they see me at the conventions and at out just getting tea or out getting Hello Kitty Cafe and I'm wearing kimono. They think it's, they think it's cool. They're always telling me, that's so awesome that you went out in kimono. <laughs> It's so cool. I, I love that uh, Japanese culture, any kind of traditional Japanese culture is transferable or travel uh, able to mm -hmm. other countries and, and other areas and, and fit into different kinds of fashion and mix match, you know, like Sheila does. She often puts Western and Japanese together. Yeah. Why not? You know, I've I'm seen showing this beautiful kimono shop. Um, that you introduced in Pasadena. I would imagine this was a kimono shop in Japan. So you have a lot of authenticity, a lot of Nisei or second generation, third generation Japanese living there. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. There's a Pasadena, Is a, there's a group in Pasadena. There's a group in Anaheim. And I've been told by my um, kimono club that one of the largest groups of Japanese is actually in San Diego at this point. And that's, you'll find a lot of demonstrations going on, a lot of celebrations. There's a Japanese garden in Gardena. There's, they have, they have Japanese grocery stores now. So you can go to Nijia and you can go to Marukai. And so you can get all the Japanese snacks and Japanese food at these locations. Book Off has several locations locations here throughout the Los Angeles area, which is a Japanese company. I wish they would have kimono off here, but there's probably not quite as much a demand for <laughs> like, over kimono as there is for book. Yeah, we have book off in Japan, of course. It's a very popular chain uh, for secondhand books. So you can get manga books. You can get a lot of, uh, you know, anime secondhand DVDs. Mm -hmm. And then downstairs, you can get a lot of secondhand clothes. But you're right. I've never seen kimono there. Why not, right? They should have some. Yes, they have a they have a specific store in Japan. They opened, I think it was last year. It is called Kimono Off. So they do have one that is completely kimono centric now. I'm not quite sure where the exact location is, but I have seen them on Instagram and I follow their account. Wow, I'll have to check that out. Kimono Off. Mm -hmm. I also notice you've got cats and your cats and kimono often goes together on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> yes. I I have two cats. I have Connie and I have Pi. Both of them are rescue cats. They came with a property that I that we bought, my husband and I, and they're they're now they adopted us. They came with it and they've adopted us and they are the sweetest, most patient kitties in the world. Connie is the more playful one. Pi is a little bit older. And so Connie is the one who tends to go after my Koshihimo and my Okuhime and just about gave me a heart attack the other day because I was holding an antique kimono and she thought it was playtime. And so she went, and I was like, no, not the kimono, anything but the kimono. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention because we also have rescue cats and mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, scratch up our clothes, just being loving, you yeah. know, when they cuddle. Um, they'll put their claws in. So yeah, I wouldn't want my antique kimono around the cats. I can barely keep the paper doors uh, from being scratched up. You know, the shoji doors in Japan. I keep having to change them. Uh, let's talk about some of your beautiful antique kimono finds. Uh, you've got this gorgeous 4th of July obi. Where did that come from? Actually, I've got this stuff behind me. Let me go ahead and grab that one. All right. Uh, there's a new eBay shop online that he is, he says he studied how to do American style auctions while living in Oklahoma. And so he recently started up a auction site on eBay. And I'll show you, I'll actually... If you give me a second, I'll run and I'll grab the other find from his site. He has some of the most unique antique Showa 
and the early Showa and Tai Show era kimono and obi that I've seen. And when this one came up, I couldn't believe it. I said, this has to have been for an event, uh, a particular show, perhaps, perhaps just post-war. I'm not sure, but it was very, very distinctly an American, I mean, obviously it's meant to be for the American audience. I couldn't think of any other reason you would have a Star Spangled, a Star Spangled Obi. It would be fun to see if I could find pictures of someone wearing this for yeah. an event. You can feel that what the fiber so oh. interesting, isn't it? But, you know, quite often, like uh, Kimono Sheila in the talk in the series, she was talking about um, some of the themes of kimono, because during the Edo era, mm -hmm. a lot of the designs and colors went inside the clothing um, because it wasn't allowed to have designs or colors on the outside. Mm -hmm. And she has collected some of these antique kimono from the Edo period, which is quite a long time ago. Um, yeah. And they have crazy, some of them are like crazy themes, like uh, a tank, like a military tank or a gunship or, you know, like all these crazy things, maybe not from Edo era, but from, you know, Showa or other eras. And some of the themes are really unexpected. So, yeah, it's funny to see the stars and stripes, but it's not completely unexpected either, right? <laughs> no, no, in fact, I was going to do a kimono. Actually, more. I'm going to be introducing a second. Besides kimono minute, I am going to be introducing a slightly longer format when I run into things. And omoshirogara is what the kimono that are called from about 1905 to the mid or mid 1940s, the ones you described that have tanks and they have city skylines, they have dirigibles on them, they have these very shocking modern artistic that you wouldn't expect to see on a kimono. I, I have seen so many people when they see some of the new modern artists that are doing things like putting dinosaur bones or Rumi Rock. I, there's a wonderful kimono store called Rumi Rock, Rumi Rock, and they are doing some of the most fun kimono designs they recently did whales that i shared and i liked i believe killer whales on one of their obis and that last year they did kabuki actors around the hem of a kimono but they were a la kiss and they were playing rock instruments and head banging on the kimono and they had like a kabuki face across the kimono to match it and you see some people <laughs> reacting very negatively to these what they consider odd modern western influenced kimono because they're so used to seeing the traditional patterns but it does have a basis in recent history with the omoshirogara kimono during like the 1905 to about 1945. That is really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm showing on screen right now some of the uh, beautiful antique kimonos that you have with really detailed embroidery you call it Nagano? No, Nagoya. Yes, the one with the, the recent one I had is a antique Nagoya obi. And I've just discovered, I have it right here. Thanks to Instagram and Twitter, I have discovered that this gorgeous dark blue kimono with butterflies on it is Nishijin, which is a specific type oh, of. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful weaving that goes into it and so this is and uh, my i have a wasai teacher i actually am taking traditional kimono sewing through virtual online with a woman from kyoto and she was i was showing this to her and she even confirmed it's called hasun so that's the length of the nagoya obi it's a slightly shorter one there are several lengths to nagoya obi and i also was being told by another young uh, person online that the not just the kanji, but there is such, I did not know this, there's such a thing called hentai gana, which it's kerangana that is unusually translated. Apparently there were more translations to kerangana than there are now. They went in and they modified it so that it would just have the four, I'm so bad, 46. The kerangana means certain things, but apparently previously they could mean other things. And a lot of kimono shops will use hentai gana to make themselves look old fashioned, to give kind of an antique air to their wares and to their sign shops. So wow. 
something new every day. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That's what I love so much about kimono, Japanese culture. Every day, it's almost every day, I stumble upon a tiny little nugget like that. I'd never heard of hentai igana before. Or knew that the shops would use them in their signs. So mm. there's always a little bit of that. And I'm like, again, it's just, I'm a forever student. I'll never get tired of it. <laughs> well, it's, it's so wonderful to hear. And I, you know, I, I know there have been some pushback in the States by people saying it's cultural appropriation. It's not uh, respectful, but you ask anyone in Japan, any traditional Japanese people who are in the kimono trade, and they are over the moon that it is popular abroad, that foreigners are wearing kimono. So yeah, don't worry about wearing kimono as a foreigner. It's, it's really embraced. And uh, it's something that a lot of Japanese people who love kimono are very happy about and encouraging. So yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it's just, it can be very hard. I had one friend who did encounter it while she was at a festival and the person was very aggressive. I'm very lucky that I haven't in, I haven't encountered it, but I do have a friend who had encountered a very aggressive person who was like, you shouldn't be wearing that. That's an insult. And I'm like, it's not oh. it's celebrating. Uh, people, you know, they just have a bee in their bonnet about something. I think uh, one, one Halloween, I wore Princess Leia costume and I had a lot of people, well, a lot, like maybe three people at a huge party come up to me and tell me that's not a Halloween costume, you know, because they're like serious Star Wars fans. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Uh, Louise Poppy has joined from New Zealand. Thanks, Louise, for joining. She said, I've given several kimono uh, by my family there. They were going to sell them off if I didn't want them. Oh. Yeah, you've, uh, Shannon, you've been to some great flea markets yeah. and picked up some good finds around. But I know Paprika Girl often is given uh, kimono from family members or elderly people who don't have anyone else to give it to. It's a wonderful tradition passing it on, isn't it? It is. And I've seen that a lot myself. I've made some purchases of other Japanese items. In fact, for my daughter's Hina, Hina Matsuri, I bought some Hina dolls online from a woman on Craigslist of all places. She was posting them and she said she had an elderly aunt there. They were over 70 years old. Nobody in the family wanted them. And so she was just selling them online. And so I bought them and she said, keep an, keep an eye out. I've got kimono for sale or I'll contact you later about the kimono because nobody in the family Nobody's family wanted them because I think you see about a 50-50 in America sometimes with Japanese families, just as you see with a lot of cultures. You've got some that are 100% embracing their history and wearing it, and you've got some that are 100% just like, I'm not going to wear that, and they aren't interested. I think you see that just even with American culture, just handing down. I have, um, my aunt is Dutch, and she has a lot of collectibles from her generation, and what do you them. And she's 81 years old and she's having to sell them off or give them to friends because it just seems it's interesting that sustainability is so there. And I think especially in America, we do have a bit of a problem with a lot of people not wanting old things. I hear that a lot. Why do I want that old thing? Because <laughs> it's cool and it has history. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm showing the photo now of you at the flea market uh, at the Nisei Festival, I believe, in California. And you said you had four staff helping you get dressed. And that was kind of an event that made you really passionate about getting more involved in learning about kimono. Is that right? Yes. Well, there were two staff members and then just two random women who saw me getting dressed. And I believe I'd only just begun to take my kids day lesson so I knew more of what to ask for and they were very surprised to see someone who knew a little bit more who wasn't Japanese they were and so all four of them came around and they're like okay you can adjust it like this and you can show a little bit more of this or you need this because this is going to make you look more it's going to pull it together more being a bit more 
how did my how's my how's my instructor? My instructor's name is Yuko Niwa, by the way. She has a rental, just gonna throw that out there. She has a rental kimono sh a shop down in San Diego where people can go and they can rent kimono for events and photo shoots. She would say, you have a Western figure. <laughs> so I need a few extra things like a corine belt and some extra padding that helps me keep that column effect that you are supposed to ideally have when you wear kimono. But it was a lot of fun to have all these, these people gather around you and kind of fuss over you. <laughs> yeah, that's gorgeous. Um, it's so funny whenever I get dressed in kimono and they they try to put lots of towels down yep. uh, to make it flat um, yep. because they always say, oh, you're so curvy. And then that doesn't look right for kimono. So we're going to make you look really flat. You know, you work really hard to to have curves. Yes. <laughs> and then they put towels on so it makes it look flat. But it does make the OB Yes. look more beautiful because it's is kept flat right yes because if you have a little bit too much in the behind <laughs> which i do for an ob the um pare the can flip up the bottom of the bottom piece that extends below say if you're wearing taiko it will flip up and that's considered very unattractive it should be lying flat and so there's all kinds of extra padding that you can put back there to help keep the ob more flat and more straight and more square and it's again all those intricacies that you don't you don't think about when you're first putting it on you first i'm just going to dress and this is this is a lot of fun and then you suddenly realize that when you're going to a formal event and i am going to separate that out if you're going to a formal event you worry about all these little things it's rather like the length of my kimono is so ridiculously embarrassingly short actually by tradition your yuki as they call it should extend all the way to your wrist because kimono is a modest culture. And so to be showing wrist or showing as much as I am, this is really gauche and embarrassing. And I sh shouldn't be doing it. If I was at a tea ceremony, I would be doing everything I could to kind of hide that my yuki is extremely short on this kimono. Unfortunately, when you are a Westerner, a lot of times your arm length is longer than traditionally you have on a kimono sleeve. So you have a lot of trying to disguise that because it's very hard to find a kimono with a long sleeve length for my arm length. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's a little bit, I think it's easier for us as, as non-Japanese looking people to wear kimono imperfectly, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and then, <laughs> like you said, a lot of people are very generous and they will help fix it, especially if you're in Japan wearing yukata or kimono. Yeah. Um, some experts who are foreign women wearing mm -hmm. in Japan, they're sometimes irritated by that because they they know how to do it. They've done it the right the way they they feel comfortable. And then sometimes people fix it the more traditional way. But I think, you know, it's it's out of kindness. Um, I'm showing a picture of you in a beautiful green kimono uh, on top, green stripes. And yeah. you are wearing a very thin belt, not not a traditional obi. So yeah. you sometimes mix and match like Western belts and uh, traditional kimono. It looks beautiful. Thank you. I started to introduce that concept again, showing to show the fact that you can wear kimono as udangi as everyday wear. You don't have to necessarily wear it fully 100% traditionally. You can. I, I, I'm going to be posting a kimono minute on this. You're getting a bit of a preview for some of my upcoming kimono minutes. But you can adjust it where you, I have a, what I'm wearing is a pinstripe black skirt over, over it. And I've used one of my koshihimo as the belt for the tie. I have black mock turtleneck underneath. So if you want to wear kimono, it's not necessarily, oh, I need to buy it. I absolutely have to wear it traditionally. If you look online, especially on Instagram, you're going to start seeing a lot of even Japanese uh, younger people wearing kimono with a modern twist. They wear it pulled up short into mini skirt length. And I've seen them match them with crazy tights and like cargo boots. And they're turning the obis forward, which would be considered rather shocking to a lot of people who are used to seeing them turned backwards. So I want to encourage that as well, that there is there are modern ways that you can bring kimono into your wardrobe to wear 
to continue again that sustainability of wear them. They're they're here, they're gorgeous, they're lasting. And the kimono has not stopped being a living fashion for over a thousand years. And that's another thing I run into with a lot of people is they see kimono as being static. It's you wear it a certain way, you don't wear it any other way. That's not true. Kimono as a fashion has never stopped advancing or moving. Hems have come up, hems have gone, hems have gone down. The width of the panels has was a little bit wider in the past. It's a little bit more narrow now. The patterns have changed where they shift up and down. The Tsukisage was created post-war to reduce the wear and tear, I guess the wear and tear, the elaborateness of a homongi, so people could wear them more often and they'd be a little bit less expensive. So that's another thing that I try to explain to a lot of people who don't know and are very well-meaning that kimono is a living fashion. It keeps going forward and people are going to experiment and do all kinds of things with it. Some of them are going to be successes, some of them may not be, but it continues to keep that rolling forward, which is, it needs to do. It's to keep it Keep it, keep it here. Keep it going. Yeah, that's great. Um, you mentioned before how many pieces are necessary for kimono and accessories and so many small details. I'm showing a picture now of you in a beautiful blue kimono, and it looks like you're shopping for kimono accessories or maybe traditional Japanese accessories of some kind, maybe chopsticks holders or hair accessories or small bands for the kimono. Um, is that in California? That's from your blog. No, that's actually Kiyomizudera. Okay. I was, staying, I was staying at a Airbnb near Kiyomizudera, which strangely enough, the woman who owned the Airbnb turned out to be a kimono instructor. <laughs> That was, I found that out after I came back from that walkabout. I put on my own kimono, all my accessories. I just bought that kimono, just bought the obi at Kitano Temangu at the flea market. And I came back from shopping around Kyoto. And she was like, oh, where are you returning that to? What shop did you rent that from? And I said, no, you know, Asashi no kimono desu. It's my kimono. And she was like, oh, you dress yourself in kimono? And I'm, yes, I'm a, you know, kimono kitsuke gakuse desu. I'm a student. So she was very happy to see it and very excited. And she actually gifted me with an obijima before I left the Airbnb. So I treasured oh, that. Sorry. That's lovely. What a lovely story. Uh, you've also on your Facebook page and your Instagram page, you've introduced about the kimono passport. Um, that you learned about through Paprika Girl. Can you talk about that? That's a great asset for anyone visiting Kyoto. Yes, it. I believe it happens. I have to reconfirm going back to Paprika Girl's Twitter because she was the original one who posted, but I believe it happens once a year around, I think it is cherry blossom season. And what they do is to encourage people to wear kimono. They have this booklet and it will list businesses that will give you discounts if you show up wearing kimono to shop at them, to eat at them. The happy there's a taxi service that gives a discount for people who are wearing who are wearing kimono. And I think it's a wonderful idea to help encourage people, especially right now, because obviously the quarantine is finally being lifted, I believe, in in Japan. And people can now get out and about more and to encourage Japanese people. And then when tourists are finally allowed back over, you know, to wear kimono, I I it's a wonderful incentive. I can't, I can't wait to get back to Japan and use it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, I was on Miyajima Island the other day and uh, passing, I went up to Mount Misen, which is the high mountain to climb up to. I was really tired, but as I was walking back down, it was getting more busy. And um, so I was live streaming on HAPS and I just happened to catch a wedding party coming through and it was so exciting. And the bride and groom were riding in a rickshaw and the bride had the white hood and the white kimono and all the wedding party behind them walking were wearing gorgeous kimono. And I just, I love that about Japan. Sometimes if you're in these classic areas like Miyajima or in the middle of Kyoto, you will see some beautiful kimono on display, people walking around for special events. 
It's gorgeous. I love it. Yeah. I caught four weddings at Meiji, at the Meiji Shrine in Tokyo when I was there during cherry blossom season. It was one right after the other going through. And just to see the brides and their different, the shiromutu, I mean, their different furisodes, and like you said, to see the wedding party, there's something just breathtaking, I think, especially about seeing an entire march of a wedding party as a fun, a fun thing. My kimono club did a wedding demonstration the year I got married, and my husband and I got to be dressed in the full wedding. Oh, wow. There is a picture on my Instagram that shows it's a little farther back. It's probably about two or three years now, but it shows me standing with my teacher and I'm wearing wedding garb and they dressed us and my instructor and the different members of the kimono club were the different members of the wedding party to do the demonstration. And that was, it's like, it is truly one of the most beautiful kimono that I've ever had the honor of wearing. Wow. Yeah. My, my sister got married and did the traditional ceremony uh, with the, all the traditional kimono and everything. But also then after the Japanese ceremony, we went to a Western church and she did the Western dress and the Western ceremony. <laughs> and then we went to the reception and I think she wore two different kimonos as well as a Western dress. I, she was so busy but yes. it was so Definitely. gorgeous to see all the costume changes. It was nice as a spectator. I'm not sure how it was as the person doing it, but it was very yes. special. Yeah. As a little bit of a side note, just tri kimono trivia. Did you know that the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, and his wife, Majel Barrett Roddenberry, were married in a traditional Japanese ceremony? They wore. Is that right? Like, wow. So they were married. I think they were married in Japan, and they wore the full the full garb they were married in a traditional japanese ceremony so trivia for star trek um, <laughs> oh. well and you know that is i mean japan really didn't slow down that much during coronavirus and and you do see weddings you do see things happening more now certainly um but we are having spikes so it might slow down again but when tourism resumes perhaps getting married in japan might be an appealing tourism product that shrines or temples shrines would be able to offer around japan how what a unique wedding that would be huh would be i actually my husband and i for our fifth wedding anniversary we're planning on coming to japan to do a full japanese ceremony so that's next year so we'll see what happens <laughs> wow that's exciting um also you often post about getting material and doing some traditional sewing classes. Is that right? Tell me about that. Yes. Well, I started to try and figure out how to sew. Well, I started with yukata. I actually have sewn three yukata myself in the past few years, trying to adjust Western patterns. I have quite literally almost every Western type of kimono pattern from 1921 until now through simplicity and the calls to compare them to see who's more authentic and what can I adjust. And so I'd already sewn two or three using them, but now I am taking a traditional class called Wasai and I am learning how to do the measurements for kimono and how to do the stitches by hand. And it is so much different than doing it by a Western pattern. The measurements, a lot of, I've heard some people say, it's just a lot of rectangles. It is, but it isn't. There are some very specific, especially the collar is the hardest because with a Western collar and with Western patterns, you, you cut out, you cut the collar. But with Japan, you have to have very specific measurements because you tend, you actually turn because you never cut except for, the, except for the rectangles. You don't cut a shape for the collar like you do with a Western pattern. So that's a very big difference. And something I learned stitch wise, because I have, I do know how to do some hand sewing and in Western stitching, you move the needle through, you'll, you'll like move the needle through the fabric and you'll pull it out. In Japan, they move the fabric to fold it onto the needle and they, like, the needle like swims through the fabric. My instructor is so fast at her stitching and the needle completely disappears into the fabric. And by the time she's done, she's got a straight line and you've never even seen the needle. I don't know how she does it yet. I'm still figuring it out. But it's been, uh, I started in November. I took a bit of a break 
and then I came back to it and I still haven't mastered it's called Nami Nui, the wave, the wave stitch. And I haven't gotten that one. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't sew, um, but, but doing this talk show series has really made me want to at least try it a little bit uh, to learn how to sew, repair things, even repair yeah. the most simply th simplest things. Um, my son in junior high school, he was in public Japanese junior high school, and he joined the home ec group. Most of them are girls so that he could learn how to sew. We got him a sewing machine. He used it a little bit. I think he made his own uh, kind of like a, a boy's version of the, the is it called the jimbe or something like a shorts and uh, kind of a yukata style top. Mm -hmm. um, he made his own. He was so proud. And I thought, oh, wow, this is great to have a sewer in the family. <laughs> now I don't need to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Got me off the hook. You know, and that's, I mean, it's interesting to note that, that so hand sewing is definitely a part of the, the Japanese culture because when the, I don't know if you've heard of boro or the different ways of layering kimono, when people would wear out kimono, they would patch it with a different piece of fabric from other kimonos. And then when that got too worn, they might take that piece of fabric and make it into a cushion or bedding. And when that gets too worn, they're still stitching layers over, but they'll turn it into a dust rag. And these dust rags have all this elaborate hand stitching in it to hold the different layers of pieces together. It's it's incredible to, just to see how it breaks down from one thing to the other, but they keep it going to that very threadbare end. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Now, you're also a photographer. Tell me about your photography. Do you often dress people up in kimono and then take their photographs? I started doing, it, it's funny, it's, it's matured because I started doing event photography. I worked for a, I worked as a convention reporter for several years where I reported on the anime and the science fiction and cultural conventions in four or five states before I switched over to doing panels on kimono. So I started as an event photographer and learned to do things that way. And then as I became more involved in kimono now with the, again, once the quarantine lifts, I definitely am moving more towards doing a kimono experience here in here in Los Angeles because they there's th two or three. I believe my like my instructor has a dressing in San Diego. I want to say there's one or two photography companies here that do do specifically kimono. So I would want to join that as well as documenting again, different kimono and people in kimono and maybe doing a little bit of, because the other photographers here in town tend to do, again, very traditional photography with kimono. And I, how did my one friend put it? She says, you have a Western eye. Well, that can seems kind of obvious, but <laughs> she, they, they're interested to see how I'm going to take it and, and make it my own. And again, add Western touches to it or fantastical touches to it that you may not normally see. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Angie Salt. She's a kimono stylist in Japan. She's from Germany originally. And she, if you look up her Instagram, she's done some beautiful fantasy kimono photography that she's dressed people for. She takes them out amongst red camellias and near the rivers. And she does a bit oh, of that great. more flowing Fantastic, fantastic, as well as modern, where she's got people in roller skates and out in the city neon lights. So she's got some very interesting and fun styling as well to look at. Wow, gorgeous. I know we've had in the series a uh, talk on kimono stylist Stasia um, mm -hmm. Matsumoto, who's in Akasaka, I believe, or yeah. Asakusa. I always get that confused. <laughs> Um, it's a very classic part of Tokyo, and she has a little shop. She does a lot of upcycling of old kimono material into uh, larger options for plus-size customers. Um, she has a lot of customers who have tattoos, and yeah. this juxtaposition of traditional kimono and modern tattoos with young people, it's really uh, it's like an art form. I'm very interested in it. I think, You've, again, I think is, it's cool. yeah, go ahead. I, so I think it's wonderful, again, because all these new people get, all these people moving kimono forward again. I always just emphasize that, always try and emphasize it's a living 
it's a living fashion. I love seeing that as it continues to work its way forward. Yeah. Uh, hi, Doug Walker. He's joined from Australia. I uh, saw him out at Bondi Beach, Sydney the other day. Thanks for joining. Uh, you've got this gorgeous Showa antique kimono material that you introduced on your Instagram. I just love the colors and the designs, really unique. That's part of the, I think, I think that is part of the modern art they were adapting because Dada art, I think it's called, I think we were pronouncing it correctly. If I have, a, I have a friend who's very much into, if I say that wrong, I think it's Dada art from around World War II and modern art and those bright, interesting, abstract colors were coming in and very popular during that time period. And when I saw that one, I haven't worn it yet because I recently moved. And so many of my kimono are packed away, but that one, and then I saw it, the colors, I'm like, I need that one to add to my collection because it was so unique and so different and so bold in its presentation. Yeah, really interesting. I love that. Um, and it, it's not the kinds of um, like patterns that you usually see. It's not the beautiful nature or animals kind of scenery. It's it's almost more modern art, like Picasso esque, or right. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I love it. Yes, it is. yes, it is. And that and again, that's why I tell people that this new, what they they consider it so new to see modern art on kimonos. It's been around for quite a while. They were doing it for a. A long time and some of the crit critics and critiques who are again used to seeing all the traditional i think they're well-meaning but i think they're a little uneducated when it comes to the the history of of kimono and the fact that yeah they've done that before <laughs> i'll often say in my panels and presentations because i do have a lot of young people who want to dress in kimono and they are scared to dress in kimono both for doing it wrong and for the cultural appropriation stigmatism that still unfortunately lingers here in the US. And I said, there is nothing you can do to a kimono that I have not seen someone in Japan already do to it. <laughs> They've already done it. That's so true. And uh, quite often, like I, in summer, you see a lot more people wearing yukata and kimono because it's, it's a great uh, thing to wear when it's so hot. It just keeps you so much cooler. Um, I noticed in the garden tour photo, you're wearing this beautiful yukata and uh, a nice, uh, I forgot the name, uh, like kimono style light jacket. I, I wear a happy coat connected to the garden. Oh, a happy coat, okay. Like a festival light coat, right? Yes, when you, when you give your tours at the garden, you have to wear the happy coat as part of your docent tour. Oh, nice. It's a very festive, like a, being at a festival. Also, you're, you're dressed up kind of in a Disney theme. So kimono and white dots on a red background, uh, hoping that Disneyland's going to reopen. I love that. <laughs> it's Disneyland reopens on April 30th. They're reopening. So... Yes, I, I'm going to be doing, I had a friend in the Kimono Club that she really wanted to do for Comic-Con. And again, this was the year that there was no San Diego Com Comic-Con International. She wanted to dress the Kimono Club up, work on it together to dress us all up as Disney prince, princess kimonos and go down and walk around outside of Comic-Con International in, in kimono. So we're still, we're still working on that. Maybe this year we'll be able to do it. Wow. That sounds fun. Uh, Disneyland or Comic-Con or any cosplay event seems perfect for kimono, no matter where you are in the world, right? Yes, it's definitely, again, it's such a part, I mean, it's part of their, especially anime conventions, but the sci-fi conventions and other cultural, pop culture events, the anime has pervaded into it. Netflix obviously has done quite a few original series themselves in conjunction with. So you see it a lot and a lot more than you used to and they're very interested in learning how to do it how to do it right so they can then break the rules it's it's rather like always cross left over right when you wear a kimono it's so important because of course when you cross right over left that's how you dress uh, a dead person how you dress someone who's passed 
But if you're cosplaying as a vampire, if you're cosplaying as a zombie, maybe a necromancer, I said, you know, hey, you know, maybe cross it over right over left and that can add an extra depth to your character. Learn the rules before you start bending them and breaking them, but then you have more depth and more of an explanation to maybe an original character you've created. Yeah, interesting. I wonder if you if you were goth and you like the the dark hair and the white skin mm-hmm. and the black makeup, uh, maybe you might choose the opposite folding mm-hmm. style, like you said. <laughs> yeah, go part for of it. the theme. Yeah, just I always say to just it's more interesting when you know why you're doing it. Yeah, the rule instead of just a mistake, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was interesting. Real quick note, I've been asked several times by people, why do you dress left over right? Why is it so important? And unconfirmed, I've only heard this from one person because most people I talk to, they say they don't know. But I spoke with a young man who grew up next to a Buddhist temple. And he told me the reason you cross left over right, and again, I'm going to say this is unconfirmed, but he said that left means spiritual and right means earthly. So what you're showing is a deference of you want to enjoy and honor the spiritual over the earthly that's what he told me why you dress left over right wow that's really interesting i'll have to go back and re-watch the yude the japanese ghost uh yeah. talk that i did with the amazing matt alt and hiroko yoda because they were giving so much insight into the stories that went into their book on yude japanese ghost yeah um yeah. i wonder if the ghosts would of you would expect would be wearing it the opposite way right that you would expect you would think because they they aren't living so that, they aren't living yeah how interesting I mean, yeah, well thank you so artwork. much for joining that is our hour finished oh. that went so fast um i love all the work you're doing i love all the enthusiasm and passion for kimono i hope you can come back and visit japan and explore all the wonderful shops again someday. Uh, hopefully by next year, maybe tourism to Japan will kind of be back in. Yeah. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers yeah. crossed that it's going to open back up again. It'd be nice. But until then, I look forward to following your kimono adventures in California. How wonderful. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Thank you for, thank you for having me on. Thank you for watching my my Instagram and my social media. And I hope that other people will take inspiration and enjoy just me having me having fun and enjoying and me. It's me. I'm enjoying myself, but I, again, sharing and educating and hopefully I'll see you online. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, now you're on HAPS. Uh, people should be able to find all your social media links very easily. Um, if someone is not watching on HAPS, what's the easiest place for them to find you? I am most active on my Instagram account. So it'd be Instagram.com backslash sunshower kimono. I also have a website, sunshowerkimono.com. Wonderful. And thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, Tomorrow we do not have a live stream talk, um, but I'm going to do some live uh, walkabouts. I'll find an interesting place to introduce you. I think I can still find some cherry blossoms. I might do a live today if I find some beautiful cherry blossoms. Um, You have to. There's only a few more days that they'll be around. So I will have to share that with you if I find some. Um, On this week, Thursday, we're talking to James about his enthusiasm for karate and he's doing a lot of interesting promotion of karate martial art around japan and around the world and then friday we have hiko simon and we'll be talking about uh, japan news and there's a lot of recent news that we should talk about so that'll be a fun one thank you so much for joining everyone thank you so much shannon thank you so much have a wonderful day and enjoy the cherry blossoms oh thank you have a great day for you as well take care everyone bye thank you